wow, I feel really stupid for reading that cow poem now. Man, what was I thinking? It's awkward. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. That was wonderful. Thank you. All right. Um, okay. All right. Uh, next guest. Um, next guest uh, actually comes from, uh, I did a, a storytelling evening for the Toastmasters. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm just ambushing you now. But I did a storytelling uh, evening uh, a few weeks ago. And um, they asked, uh, there were a bunch of uh, guests telling stories. And um, they asked uh, if anyone wanted to come up and tell a story, just kind of spontaneously. And, uh, and the, the theme of the evening, I, I can't remember what the theme was. Lies. Thank you. Yes, lies. Uh, and um, the... And she volunteered to come up and tell a story, and uh, without any preparation, uh, I'm assuming. And you did, and she did amazing. And when uh, the next day, uh, I through the picture, I, I found her on Facebook. I feel stupid <laughs> telling this, and I emailed her and I asked her if she wanted to come to this evening because I thought she would be great. Um, and so, and she brought a friend, which was really smart. <laughs> Uh, which is, uh, you should always do when a stranger asks you to meet them on Facebook. Um, so, uh, so anyway, uh, I would like to uh, invite her to come up uh, here. Uh, so, uh, Monica, would you like to come up and tell a story? So, hi everybody, and thank you for the great presentation. Now I feel a little bit under pressure, but it's okay. Um, so I will give you two options because I really didn't know what to expect from tonight so I brought an old story I wrote uh, which accidentally I translated in English which is really good and practical or I can just tell something I came up yesterday with under the shower which I don't know if it's so good so I can read this one <laughs> uh, I wrote it many years ago and I don't know if it reflects the person I am today but you don't know me so it will be fine <laughs> <laughs> and it's two pages so choose wisely <laughs> no both come on I've got to save some ideas you can do the other one later hmm? you can do one now and the other one later maybe yes yeah, maybe okay I will read this one if it's fine for you two pages okay <laughs> So there is no title, I don't remember the title, so yeah, let's call it the story of a rainy day. He lied to her, he lied to her and deceived her, he lied to her and deceived her and deluded her. She moved a wet lock of her hair from her forehead with a nervous and together resigned gesture, knowing that it would fall again over her eyes in a few seconds. Why had she gone out without taking her umbrella? It had just stopped raining and untidy trickles of water ran along the irregular surface of the asphalt, while the sky was clearing up and was seeming to lighten. It lied to her. Since the very beginning, there had been nothing but lies. And she knew. She knew. But she didn't want to believe it, hoping that a chimera could be reality, and trusting there were no logical and rational reasons why her life could not look like the fabulous and mythical dream she'd always wanted it to bear a resemblance to. She barely avoided a big puddle in front of the old tobacconists. Looking at herself in the huge window to try to arrange her straight hair, which had been made briskly by the wind and the water, she stared at her own image shaking her head with a bitter expression. Then she noticed for the first time the wooden worm-eaten sign hanging on the threshold with its big red color letters faded by that moment, closed. Closed. It was all over, in fact. Silvio, so English story with Italian names, would have never left his wife, at least not for her. Mrs. Prenzolini was still an attractive woman, despite of the fact that she was 50, and very, very wealthy. Silvio and she had two wonderful sons, a successful lawyer and a talented journalist, and a marvelous daughter, just about to graduate. Literature, maybe, or whatever. The truth dazzled her, her while she was angrily staring at one of her nibble nails on the point to break. Who would leave a perfect world of reassuring certainties to go and shut themselves up a kind of hut in an absolutely unknown town in the Alps? Not Silvio. 
She had always known that, even though this hurt her, since the very first moment their sights met at the entrance of the subway, for a man used to quietness and normality, the most scandalous and outrageous thing would have been keeping a lover for one year or two, until, until the latter had found out, listening to Mrs. Prenzolini's hairdressers gossiping, that he still loved his wife. Heaven knew how, that he would have never told his lover not to mess things, that there was no point he would buy a house in Trentino and leave everything he had this way. And yet, she still loved him. But she would finish with him at last, at lower costs, even messing things a lot. At the turning of Dante Street, she quickened her pace, nervously peeking at her watch. Half past three. She'd better hurry. She had a job interview in Bellini High Street at a quarter to five. Who knows, she might have proved just the typist they needed so desperately. She definitely would make it. Silvio was going to take her only a few minutes. She only had to finish with him. She was determined to do that. She'd do that. She almost began running, listening to the shuffling of her rubber shoes on the puddles with an unusual feeling of relief when her attention was drawn to the glittering window of an, of an antique dealer's, which was just around the corner. How was it called? Facchini, right? Such a beautiful place. How many times, like that day, she had contemplated the interior of that shop with her nose pressed against the glass. She was crazy about ancient objects, which she had never been able to afford. Silvia too adored them, and in fact he filled his studio nearby with them. She was about to leave, when she noticed a gorgeous brass candelabrum, very well decorated, which surely had just arrived, as she had never seen it before. 18th century. She nodded her head, convinced. It was just the sort of objects Silvio liked most. He definitely hadn't seen it yet, otherwise he would have surely bought it. What if? Well, yeah, couldn't she go in and take it? It was perfect. Who would have been surprised to see it in Silvio's apartment? It was well known how much he liked ancient objects. She stared at the candelabrum with an anxious and eager expression. It was perfect. It went very well with the other furniture. Who would have never thought about her? It was a quick peek at her watch that persuaded her to forget about it. Ten to four already. She quickened her pace, squeezing up in her beige raincoat. Her feverish agitation increased as she got closer to her destination. She had no hesitations, however. She needed to go through the whole scene mentally. Maybe it would not be easy. Or maybe it would. Didn't he perhaps deserve it? Did he perhaps accept her to go on forgetting about it? She reached the entrance at 7 Roma Avenue. Damn, those hinges. Why didn't anybody hold them? What were they waiting for? She listened to the noise of her own footsteps along the damp and silent stairs with satisfaction. She got to the landing. 4 o'clock. She squeezed her hands in her pocket she frowned with a resolute expression, and she opened the door wide with a sharp outburst. She found him there, in the middle of the room. Down the stairs, hurriedly to the rusty gate, at breakneck speed out, in the avenue, under the rain that was beginning falling again. Silvio, 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 oh my god! My god! She panted, blindly running along the street, she closed her eyes, she rubbed them, as to get rid of the rain and her tears. That! He was dead, yeah. How could she cancel from her mind the image of his body prone on the ground with black, blackish gushes of blood but untidy flowed on the precious embroidery of a Persian carpet? Dead. Dead because of a shot of a gun in his back which cut ever knows what very important artery or vein or maybe it a vital organ. Vital. Was that possible? She stopped after a few endless minutes, deadly pale, falling into a bench that had been varnished white for a little time. She smelled the bitter pain tenting her nostrils, till her in her soul, while she kept touching her already soaking hair with convulsive gestures. Dead. After some time, she often thought about that moment, trying to realize how long it took her to calm down. Silvio Predelli died while he was murdered on April the 15th, 2000, in the afternoon. And the police? Would they find the corpse? Hour could pass. Oh no, his neighbor would have called them before. 
But where was his neighbor? She didn't remember hearing noises in the apartment nearby before entering Silvio's farm. Where was she? What was she doing? Why, well, sure, a shopping and a rent. How silly she was not to have thought about it before. But then, police would come. They would make sure about the hour of his death, they would question the other tenants of the building, they would investigate Silvio. But would they ever find the murderer? Silvio, Silvio, would they ever find out who was that killed him? And how? What a horrible hand, hand he had, poor Silvio. He must have not died at once. No, there must have been several minutes of agony. Really atrocious. And also all that blood, all that blood, Silvio. There was some on the carpet, along the walls, among the blocks of the parquet, on the armrests of the armchair, on the legs of the ebony table. There were squares of it even on the ceiling and on those nice embroidery curtains that they bought together on a summer day, nine months earlier. But what police would think? There was too much blood, too much, too much. They would consider the whole scene, they, with a perfect detached rational logic, and sure, they would decide it was a crime of passion. She was in trouble. Well, sure. What was more likely that the poor lover, finding out she had been deceived and deluded, hurried to Mr. Bradley's studio to kill him in a moment of desperate madness? She stood up, she trembled, she had a look around in an anxious and stirring way, she touched her hair, she hesitated, she sat down again. She gently tore up the thread from her, her tights. And also that shot of gun, suitable to a passionate and fierce death. With all that blood all around, what could she do then? Silvio. She looked around as suddenly lit by a bitter idea. What about a very strong blow, maybe to his head? Wouldn't it have been better? Exactly, a blow to his head, quick, effective, precise, given with any heavy object a little identifiable, less blood, more mysterious, more difficult to understand. A first degree murder, an accidental one, or whatever, Damn, she tapped her forehead violently, then she hid her face between her hands, and finally she raised her chief with a faraway and regretful expression. It was twenty to five. She stood up snorting and she entered Bellini High Street. She had to hurry if she wanted to arrive on time, but she couldn't help thinking about the fatal blow to his head that there hadn't been. Much better than any bullet, so exact, functional, perfect, perfect. Definitely, it'd been far better if she had entered and bought that candelabrum. Four hours later, the police found a small gun thrown with untidy precision among the rubbish into a wheelie bin at the beginning of Bellini High Street. Thank you. <clears throat>